Hello, Hidden Gems. It's time for another Hidden Hour, a live Hidden Hour, a specialty here at Hidden True Crime, where each weekend, usually on Saturday, we uh, go live with our gems, with all of you here today. So it's so good to see so many of you already here. I can't believe it. Starting out, we already have over 650 people with us. It means so much. And I'm seeing that we have people from Cairns, uh, Australia. We have uh, someone from Israel, from Jerusalem. It's a place I did a study abroad. And uh, we are just grateful for a little bit of a break ourselves. Dr. John and I, uh, we, we skipped yesterday because we had a family birthday party, but it happened to be a pool party when in record breaking heat, it has been so <laughs> hot. It's 115 degrees today. I got, I caught on the car thermometer yesterday, 120 degrees. So we've been recovering and we are so glad to uh, be with all of you tonight and to discuss a subject that we've definitely been discussing in our house. And I know that the internet's been talking all about Rex Hurman, also known as the Gilgo, the man accused of the Gilgo Beach serial killings, or also Lisk, or the Long Island serial killing. So uh, I don't know, John, what you're, how you're going to choose to talk about him today, but it's going to be a very interesting show tonight. So um, let your friends know that we're here, and I'm looking forward to learning quite a bit myself as well. I have so many questions. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks. For, thanks for joining us. I, I noticed somebody said in the comments that that they hoped we had good AC for our show uh, tonight. So I'll I'll say this: John has better AC than I do. I'm <laughs> I'm in a uh, it, it was a room that was an addition to the house, and uh, we didn't do the addition, but people were too into making sure that the AC worked well where I am. So I'm actually. A little hot. And then John's AC, though, if you hear the fan go on behind him, that's his AC working extra hard. Uh, I'll and yeah, right. just be thinking yeah. of me where I am. I'm hot. <laughs> I'm very hot. Hopefully, hopefully people can hear me because I'm sure the AC is going to be on the whole time. But uh, so if either one of us happens to pass out, <laughs> don't worry. You'll know the reason. It's something related to heat stroke or heat stroke from the party yesterday. So we were out, but we were out for four hours and 115 degree heat yesterday. And well, I was out for six because I went, uh, being the good mother that I am, it was for our, our, our son. I went two hours early to set up. So <laughs> I, uh, yeah, six hours for me. It's, it was brutal. I, I, we, we were going to actually maybe go live last night and early on we thought, no way, we're going to have to recover. So thanks for being <laughs> with us on an, thanks for being with us on an unusual Sunday night. Thank you. Yeah. So anyway, we're here. We made it, and let's let's talk about Lisk. I think I'll refer to him as Lisk or Rex Hewerman, but Lisk is a little shorter, so that might save us some time. We all know who this is. So, uh, you know, the first thing I want to say is talking uh, about uh, really quickly, and 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 Lisk is Rex Hewerman specifically is innocent until proven guilty. Right. Let's reiterate that that the. the we don't know that he's committed these crimes for sure. The evidence is circumstantial, although I think some of it's pretty compelling. compelling. Yeah. But but he still has to go to trial and he'll get his day in court. So he's currently, obviously, he's innocent until proven guilty. And we always start with that assumption. So in that sense, I think uh, I want to talk more broadly about serial killing in general and some of the research on it. It, it's obviously a very, very big topic, and it's it's been covered a lot in the popular media. So, in, But in terms of the academic research on serial killing, there's not a huge amount, believe it or not. And the reason is because there's not a big sample, and there's not that many serial killers to examine. So a lot of the research tends to be qualitative, which makes sense because you can't set up an experiment where people are killing other people and examine yeah. what those elements are. So, so the research on serial killing is, is somewhat vague and therefore I think there's, there's a lot of speculation and it's not entirely clear cut and serial killers are different. There's idiosyncrasies among serial killers, obviously there's different types of serial killing and 
There's been different typologies developed to explain serial killing. So it's a big topic. We're going to start broadly talking about it, and then we're going to—I'll narrow in a little bit on um, Rex Hewerman and some of some of the elements I think that might apply here to him. But let me just start with a broad characterization. This is from a textbook. This is probably my favorite criminal psychology textbook. It's Bartle and Bartle. It's called Criminal Behavior. It's now in its twelfth edition. So the twelfth edition was in 2021. I believe the the 11th edition was like 2017. I actually prefer the 11th edition, but don't please don't tell the authors that. The 12th edition is is more up to date and it's got some of the latest research, but I I, I think it's not quite as detailed. So, but let's talk about so this textbook Bartle and Bartle identify broadly speaking four characteristics that tend to apply to serial killers in general. Those are control domination, thrill-seeking, and oftentimes media attention. So if we think about those elements, those four elements of serial killers, I think we can check all those boxes for Lisk, right? That, in fact, I would go so far as to say that I think the main theme that I'm, I'm picking up on at the moment that pertains to Rex Hewerman would be the theme of domination. This is someone who wants to be in control this is someone who values his power. This is someone who physically and maybe emotionally and psychologically exerts a certain amount of dominance, it seems quite frequently. So I think the main motif here, so if we look at serial killers, broadly speaking, and some of those four qualities, the one that really stands out for Hewer, Hewerman is domination. If we... Okay. Yeah, so... If we then look at, so another question that people have asked is, what are some of the characteristics of victims of serial killers? And I think that's equally important, right? Because As in you, you, target, you, tar you target certain victims, in other words. Right, that victims become targets. And victims for, for serial killers are actually quite different than the victims for, let's call them one-off or one-time murders, that they tend to be quite different, that they... People that murder people, you know, like a spouse, for example, a lot of that has more to do with the characteristics of the relationship. And, and there's more of an interpersonal quality and there can be more of a reactive quality. In other words, so the murderer, instead of planning something and organizing it and premeditating the murder, for example, in interpersonal violence, some of those tend to be a little more spontaneous and they tend to be more what we call reactive violence. So they... So in, with serial killers, though, you're not going to see that. You're going to see more organized, premeditated murder. And therefore, the victims will often have similar characteristics. So, and this is, again, this is from Bartle and Bartle, the textbook. The, the three common elements that serial killer victims tend to have in common are availability. So that the, the serial killers know that they have access to the victims um, fairly readily if possible, or in some cases, uh, their victims tend to be vulnerable, especially vulnerable. So they target vulnerable populations, which could be the elderly. It could be, as in this case of Rex Hewerman, it could be women that are in vulnerable positions doing sex work, for example. Okay. And the final element of victims and serial killers is desirability. So typically serial killers would target a certain segment of the population that they find desirable, that they find attractive in some way. So again, here with Rex Hewerman, we have victims that are roughly the same age. They're in their early 20s. They all seem to have a particular physique or body type. They tend to be slender. Petite. They're attractive. I'm sorry, petite. petite. Yeah, right. They're shorter even sometimes too. Mm-hmm. So he, de he definitely seems to have a type in terms of desirability. So again, serial killers, broadly speaking, they tend to focus on these elements of victims, whether they're available. So in other words, whether they can create an opportunity, whether they're vulnerable. So with Rex Hewerman, the, the vulnerability comes into play because as, as you learned from your interview with Nikki, that Nikki was quite explicit about saying that he believed the victims were expendable. Right. And Nikki said that he, that she believed 
the victims were, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Nikki also said that she believed, quote, the victims were people nobody would care about or look for. This is Nikki Brass. This is our interview or my interview with Nikki Brass, a woman who states that she went out with Rex Heuerman in 2015 while she was, uh, uh, while she was uh, a sex worker at the time and an addict. She explains how she got out of that situation, uh, but she was in this vulnerable position. And you can see that interview on our uh, on our channel. Sorry, go ahead, John. I just wanted to explain where people could get that. Okay. Yeah. So, so yeah. And, and I want to thank Nikki, by the way, I want to, since I didn't interview or talk to Nikki, I want to thank her for her interview and her great insights. I think she was really helpful in terms of making sense of some of, some of what's going on here. Um, but if we look at, if we look at these characteristics of the victims of serial killers, Rex Hewerman checks all the boxes here too. So the victims were vulnerable. Um, Nikki was quite clear about that. And she believed that, that the victims that had already been found by then in 2010 and 2011 were, as she said, quote, expendable. And so serial killers tend to, to focus on that as well. You know, when you think about Dahmer, Jeffrey Dahmer or Israel Keys, or, you know, th th many of them, found victims that uh, were vulnerable, that were down and out in some way, or uh, they were perceived to be, by Israel Keys at least, they were perceived to be weak, um, they were accessible, and um, this desirability part also obviously comes into play with Hewerman because he's interested in sexual gratification and he has to find his victims have to meet uh, apparently a certain type or threshold for him, I think, to really to act on his sexual impulses. I just slowed down the chat, everyone, for everyone's request. Sorry, <laughs> go ahead, Bish. Okay. So, so those are, I think that's, that's maybe a good way to get into this discussion is to talk about kind of the broad criteria that serial killers and their victims tend to kind of meet. Um, I think if we dig a little deeper though, I think we get into the idea of what's called lust killing. Okay. So lust killing is essentially when you merge sexual desire with a desire to dominate. So those are kind of the two elements, but lust killing is essentially sexual serial killing. Okay. And you mentioned that he was dominating. You've already said that. Right. Is, and, and yeah. you know, the interview with uh, Bonjour Realty, he says that, that, you know, he had this firm handshake that he was imposing. He is a domineering, interesting man. Okay. So lust. Yeah. Well, it, yeah, it tends to come, this idea of dominating or domination and control comes up a lot with him. I'll talk about some colleagues, work colleagues that saw him this way. Um, Robert Tafera, who's a well-known, apparently a well-known contractor or very well-known and sought after contractor in New York City, uh, made some comments for the New York Times about Hewerman because he worked with him quite closely. So clearly this issue of dominance is important. But um, so lust killing is merging sexual desire with a desire to dominate. And it, it's, it's essentially sexual, sexual serial killing. And there's actually a couple of books I want to reference that we'll, I'll be referring to quite a bit tonight. One is Understanding Sexual Serial Killing. This is probably the latest wow. book on the topic by Totes, T-O-A-T-E-S, Totes and Totes. And the other book I think that's really relevant to this discussion is called The Psychology of Lust Murder. That's by Purcell and Arrigo. That was published in 2006, Psychology of Lust Murder, paraphilia, sexual killing, and sexual homicide. So there's actually, a, or let me back up just a little bit and talk about this idea of what psychologists, this is in the DSM-5, what psychologists call paraphilias. So paraphilias are, broadly speaking, would be defined as abnormal sexual behaviors or maybe deviant sexual behaviors, aberrant sexual behaviors. Some paraphilias are harmless, Many aren't. So an example of 
a paraphilia that would be harmful would be pedophilia. Pedophilia would be someone who is aroused and sexually attracted to children, and specifically children under age 13, at least by DSM criteria. So that's an example of a paraphilia. There's hundreds of paraphilias, by the way. Many of them, most of them, the vast majority of them are not listed in the DSM. But there's actually a paraphilia for that many people aren't aware of. There's a paraphilia for lust killing. And it is called erotophono. I'm sorry. I knew I was going to say that wrong. (laughs) It's a mouthful. (laughs) We're we're waiting. What is this called? Okay. (laughs) It's called erotophonophilia. Let me let me say it again. Erotophonophilia. That's that's that is the the term for lust murder or lust killing. I'm gonna I'm gonna read here from. I'm gonna do, I'm gonna have uh, Purcell and Arrigo define this a little better. So I'm gonna read from their book, their introduction where they define it. Erotophonophilia is the acting out of injurious behaviors by brutally and sadistically assailing the victim. These actions are undertaken so that the offender can achieve sexual satisfaction. Lust murderers are likely to repeat their crimes, making them serial in nature. Mutilation of body parts, especially the genitalia, represents a routine characteristic of this form of paraphilic deviance. So so broadly speaking, Rex Heuermann would be considered to have this paraphilia. Paraphilias, by the way, are quite common or expected among sex offenders in particular. Oftentimes, as I said earlier, when you pair kind of sexual desire with this desire to dominate, then you get into to violence. Of course, sexual offenses are violent in and of themselves. So it, a sex offense is by definition a form of violence, violence, but some sex offenders who engage in sexual assault or lust murder are obviously taking the violence to an extreme. So they're committing sexual crimes and violent acts at the same time. Okay. Wow. In, I'm taking that in. Wow. Okay. The things we learn, the things <laughs> I learned from my husband that I never Right. So if, if, uh, if somebody asks you about list, just say, oh yeah, that's a lot of, <laughs> I can't even pronounce it. That's, Erotophonophilia. Um, yeah. Interestingly, oh, yeah, we know that. interestingly, though, with with Hewerman, and we're, we're just, I'm just going to mention this tonight. We're going to talk about this in another time, but uh, you know the in the 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 bail statement that was released by NYPD. There's there's a discussion of his. It's redacted, by the way, but other people have found the non-redacted version somehow. But the, his searches, his web searches, his internet searches are filled with searches for child material, you know, that's right. illegal child material. I can't mention that term or we're going to get right. we know what you're We know what you're referring to. Yeah. Right. And so, and so I think, you know, that was, that was an interesting, that was an interesting element of this crime for me because... Some lust killers have an attraction to children, but I mean, a lot of them kind of have a similar age range that they're interested in. So for, for Hewerman, initially it appears like early 20s, right? But, but to find out that he's searching for roughly, we looked at some of the searches and there does seem to be a specific age range, which is roughly 10 to 14-ish. That, by the way, that specific age range is is called hebophilia. So, pedophilia. I know this is going to get confusing. Stay with me here. No, no, you're you're doing great. You're you're in rare form. To, well, you're always doing great, so it's not rare form. But you're you're doing wonderful. Thank you. We're following. Thank you. So, so pedophiles tend to have a, a, an attraction to prepubescent children, and hebophiles. It they're it's usually so ten to fourteen is usually children that are maybe a little prepubescent, but you know, they're kind of, they're getting into puberty, right? It's, it's that gray area. And so it's not clear. I think it, it's, it's an interesting part of this case because it really raises the question about whether he is attracted to children and to what degree. And it brings up another issue, which is that often 
I've worked with many sex offenders and evaluated many sex offenders over the years. Many sex offenders have multiple paraphilias. So you, you typically won't have one. And so you're, you're seeing that here. You're seeing the possibility of hebophilia or pedophilia or, and, and I'm sure by the way, so, uh, you know, sadism or sadomasochism can be another paraphilia. Um, that's a little more complicated in terms of whether the person is distressed by it. So uh, to add another layer of complication to this, to get a diagnosis for a paraphilia, essentially there has to be some level of social or occupational or clinical distress. So in other words, behavior has to somehow bother the person or distress the person or create, um, create some discomfort. So we call that, psychologists call that something that's ego dystonic as opposed to ego syntonic. So I know this sounds a little crazy, but imagine that, well, let's, let's take sadomasochism, for example. Okay. Some people might be distressed by that. Many people won't. So if, if, if somebody has, for example, an interest in sadomasochism and it doesn't interfere with their life and it's ego syntonic and they don't see any problem with it and it becomes a normal part of their, let's say, sexual practices, then it wouldn't qualify for a diagnosis. So it wouldn't be clinically significant, right? It's a little more complicated with something like pedophilia in the sense that pedophilia, so this is, this is where it gets a little, a little tricky, but so pedophilia is obviously illegal Correct. by any law or any standard, right? So it presents a problem there. So, but if somebody is attracted to children and they don't find that to be ego dystonic, in other words, they don't have a problem with that. In fact, they prefer that, um, you know, then it, it gets into this issue of, okay, well, so is that a diagnosis? I mean, it may not be. It may, it, people will recognize that it's illegal and that's probably going to create some distress. They recognize you can't go out and molest children, right? And so maybe that's where the distress comes from. But so I guess my point is that there's a difference between the legality of something and whether someone finds that behavior to be acceptable. Those are two different, but I, I don't want to get, I don't want to go too far down this path. I just, my main point here is that Rex Hewerman has multi, he seems to have multiple paraphilias, which is consistent with people that have paraphilias. His main one seems to be erotophonophilia, which is lust murder. And there seems to be some possibility of pedophilia or hebophilia here too. So, and, and probably some stuff around sadism. I, you know, I don't know. We're, we're just getting into this case. We're obviously going to learn more. Let me talk a little bit. I, I want to clarify. People are like saying like pedophilia, of course it's illegal. And of course it's not normal. That's what John is saying. It isn't normal, but sometimes an offender might start to think, I just want to clarify. Yeah. What I'm saying is that when I'm talking about purely from a clinical standpoint, that it's, it's a peculiar, it can be a peculiar diagnosis. Oftentimes people that are pedophiles will have some distress, but sometimes they won't. So in and other that's words, a concern. that's a problem. Right, that's a concern, right? An offender that has no distress about molesting children is a problem, obviously. It's a major so problem. It's a yeah. major, right? It's a ma and so my point, so I maybe this, maybe this is a simpler way of summarizing it, that a, a pedophile that sees that behavior is perfectly acceptable and doesn't care about the legalities of it is someone without a conscience. How about that? That's helpful. Thank you. That's someone without a conscience that says something. Yeah. Right. And, right. And so, and that's, you know, yeah. Okay. So maybe that's a simpler way of, of clarifying that issue, but Lisk seems to have multiple paraphilias. That's, that's my main point here. And um, so for me, it's, it's a little bit of a curiosity to, to know or learn whether he ever acted on his this apparent attraction to children. And he's also, by the way, associating these same elements. It seems like he's associating these same elements with children. 
that which is sexual desire and the desire to dominate, which again are the elements that you'll find with lust killing. So, uh, you know, there was a child, there was the body of a child found among the 11 bodies in Gilgo Beach. But so far, we don't know if there's a connection to Hewerman and we don't know if that was a sex crime as well, right? So I, there's a lot of uncertainty here, but um, but that would certainly that would certainly elevate these crimes to an entirely different level, and that would you know I don't know that would that would make this guy in a really rare league if he's targeting children as well, sexually targeting children, and I believe that the body they found was a two year old. So I mean that's that's unthinkable, right? So. Yes. Um, Black Bear Speak says you have a well-educated audience. Dr. Bay's point was not lost on most of us. Don't worry. Thank you. Okay. And I, right. I am the one that's always over worrying. So thank you. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, I, I know if I don't clarify things the right way, I'm going to get some pushback. So <laughs> yeah, I'm, brace, I'm bracing for some of the emails. Um, but thank you. I appreciate that comment. So I want to go, let me, let me go to totes for a little bit. The textbook that I mentioned um, totes, and this is a huge oversimplification because the, in the totes textbook, he, he goes through hundreds of cases. It's a really comprehensive look at sexual serial killing. It's really, uh, a comprehensive textbook. And I'm, so I'm going to, I'm not going to do it justice here, but for the sake of a short program, <laughs> I have to summarize things and try to distill them down to their essence. So that's what I'm going to do here. So totes, totes argues and again, his research is mostly a summary of other people's research and so and mostly qualitative. But Totes makes the argument that there's two main prongs to lust murder or erotophonophilia. I'm sorry. I'll get it right one of these times. Um, <laughs> I think it's adorable. I've never heard him not be able to pronounce a word. So Yeah, I, I was saying it fine earlier. <laughs> I think I'm a little dehydrated because of the 115, but erotophonophilia. There we go. So um, the two main motivations or prongs of lust killing, according to totes, are one, dominance. We've talked about that. So, and we'll we'll be develop I'll be developing this idea of dominance with Humerman a little later, but the other element is humiliation. So Totes sees those two as kind of working together to lead to uh, lust murder. And again, I want to point out, like one of the things that's important to recognize is somebody might have an obsession with dominance and somebody might have some humiliation in their past or dealt with humiliation. That doesn't mean they're going to become a lust murderer. The, the, the argument is always that there's always a particular idiosyncratic set of circumstances that come together that lead to the creation of a serial killer. So when I talk about bullying, for example, when I talked about bullying with Brian Koberger, I wasn't saying that somebody who's bullied is going to become Brian Koberger or that there's a causal, there's never a causal relationship between something in someone's past and becoming a serial killer or becoming a murderer. Thank you. It's a, right. It's an idiosyncratic combination of elements. Like with Koberger, for, for example, a few people wrote to me and said, well, you're saying that people that are obsessive compulsive are murderers. And I'm saying, no, I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that, that somebody like Koberger who had violent fantasies and had these, he almost certainly, that's another element, by the way, a commonality according to the psychology of lust murder that all lust killers have in common is they all have violent fantasies. Many of them are violent sexual fantasies. Many of them are just violent fantasies, but they all have violent fantasies. My argument with Koberger is that I never, first of all, I never diagnosed him with OCD, but my argument is and was and is that the violent fantasies are the problem, not the OCD. It's the Correct. violent fantasies that become obsessive, that, that begin to dominate someone's thoughts. That's what, that's what presents the problem. Yes. And so I would say the same thing about humiliation or even shame. <clears throat> it's not being humiliated once or bullied once that matters. It's how it gets interpreted by the killer or the would-be killer and how the person doesn't let go of it. So let me, 
This is from page 72 in Understanding Sexual Serial Killing. One common feature underlying the aggression shown by serial killers is earlier humiliation, such as being rejected or ridiculed. The issue is never resolved and it gnaws away over the years. Aggression, aggression is rewarding and tends to restore some kind of psychological equilibrium, albeit only very briefly. So he's, he sees, he basically sees the two fundamental mo motivations that lead to lust murder as dominance and humiliation. Um, and again, let me repeat, the issue is never resolved and it gnaws away over the years. That's, that's, I think the important point is that it's not the humiliation or the shame or, and actually in the case of Hewerman, at least one of his high school classmates has spoken up and said that he was bullied in high school. I don't know how badly, I don't know why he was bullied. This is something we're going to, we're going to really try to figure out here, but there was apparently some bullying. The, the classmate also said that he did fight back a little bit. So, um, and again, I'm not saying there's a causal relationship between the bullying, but it's these experiences of humiliation that as Toast just said, as I just quoted, that gnaw away at someone. I think for Koberger, it's the shame that was involved in the bullying that really ate away at him, gnawed away at him over the years. He, that it, it, it's, it's the unresolved component. So there's many kids that are bullied that are resilient, that just right. brush it off and they resolve it in some degree, right? To some degree, but it's the kids that can't resolve it. It's the kids that hang on to it. And that's where I think OCD comes into play. That somebody with uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, and I, I don't know if Koberger has that. I speculated that he has obsessive tendencies. That's as far as I'll go, because I don't know more, but mm -hmm. it's the obsessive component that creates the problem insofar as Koberger can't resolve it, right? That's, that's the problem. And that's so, the problem. So presumably, I, I, would, I would say, I would guess, speculate with, with Rex Hewerman that there's some trauma. There's probably multiple traumas from childhood. We don't know exactly what those are, and they're unresolved. They show up again and again in his life, and they probably have some, they play some role or contribution to his lust killings. That makes sense. Thank you. And by the way, we almost have 4,000 people in chat. If you guys could all find the thumbs up button at some point now or later, it, it means a lot so we can share our channel and John's immense wisdom with many people. Thank you. Go ahead, babe. So, um, so yeah, let's, let's, Let's dig a little deeper into, so now I've kind of talked in general terms about maybe some of the categories that Rex Hewerman tends to fit into and um, possibly some of the motivations. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm being really, really broad here. You know, I, I apologize. We just don't have the, we don't have the, the time to dig super deep here, but. But this is the beginning where this is right. one. This is not our one and only. We're going to continue following this case. We're giving a broad over, overlay today, and we'll be going uh, in detail later. So, yeah. So let, let, me, let me talk about a few things I think that are interesting that, that – also need some attention here. One was, and my source for most of this, by the way, is the New York Times. So almost every article that the New York Times has written about this case, I've read, I'm using some of those quotes here. I trust that the New York Times has vetted these sources. There's just too much information out there for us to vet. There's a lot of speculation on YouTube channels. I, you know, just for me to feel comfortable here, I've had to keep it within the domain of journalistic sources that I feel are credible and have talked to people and vetted them. Outside of that, our sources are videos that we've seen people discuss him and we believe that they're 
they're accurate and honest sources. Nikki would be one of those. We believe Nikki Brass. So this is from one of the New York Times articles. Um, this is actually from somebody that that worked in one of the local grocery stores on Long Island where the family shopped. And the the clerk at the grocery store said, quote, he's talking about the Hewermans here, or he's talking about Rex. He never shopped with his family, and his family always appeared to be cheerless. So, wow. Um, so that's interesting. I, you know, that's, that's a little comment, but it's interesting that this clerk had worked there for over a decade, and she said every time that, am I pronouncing this right? Is it Asa? Asa? Asa. 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 Asa Ellerup, who's Rex Hewerman's wife. Soon to be ex wife. She just filed for soon divorce. To be, yeah, soon to be ex wife. Asa. Uh, when Asa would, would come into the store with one or both of their children, she always showed up alone. She never, ever went to the store with Rex, at least when this person was there. And this the person working at the store had discussed some of her colleagues, and they said they never, ever saw Rex shopping with his family one time over a decade. And she also mentioned that when they did show up, that they appeared to be really cheerless. One of the neighbors, one of the neighbors in the, in the neighborhood said of the family, quote, they were always reclusive and, en and enigmatic. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to now read a quote from Nikki. This is during your interview. Okay. As Nikki's interview with us. Interview with, right, with us. As to why Nikki felt that Rex Huerman was committing these crimes, she said, quote, it was an escape from a life that he didn't want. He was not happy with his family life and he found it very boring. Hmm. Uh, you know, when, when you start, when I start looking at all these little pieces um, here, let me read. This is from a work colleague, Paul Tietelbaum, Paul Tietelbaum, Paul Tietelbaum, was on a board with Rex Hewerman for several years. Here's what Paul T and he so and so he was in the architecture business in New York. Here's what he said, describing Rex. He's a cold and distant person, kind of creepy, with a swagger of, I'm the expert, you're lucky to have me. So he's describing someone, you know, cold, distant, remote. Um Another person who was on a project with Rex Tillerman, I mean, Hewerman, and this is from New York Times again, said, quote, he was rude and dismissive. Kelly Parisi, who was on a co-op board with Rex Hewerman for five years, says, quote, he was adversarial with everyone and he was overly fastidious. So the board fired him. I mean, so... I think what, what starts to emerge when you look at what people are saying about him and their perceptions of him, I think what, what starts to emerge is someone who really doesn't connect with people very well, right? This is someone who appears to be clearly distant, right? This is someone who's distant and he doesn't seem to have the best social skills. And again, this would be typical of many serial killers, by the way, but this is someone who's not really good with people. Um, and in fact, I, I would go if 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 I were looking for clinical diagnoses, you know, one thing that kind of stands out or might stand out here, I think, would be some type of depression. I'm not diagnosing, but I mean, his family is described as cheerless. He's seen as cold. He's never warm. He's never engaging. This this feels like someone who's depressed to some degree. And, and I don't know if that's true. I've never met with him, obviously, but th they just have this sense of of Rex Hewerman's life that it's it's. You know, as Nikki said, it's boring. He's trying to escape from it. You know, I, I think you have a portrait here of someone who's really struggling with depression. You have a portrait here of someone, I think, who is probably has issues with self-worth. You know, I see Rex 
Hewerman as being someone who probably has some damaged sense of self. And again, I don't know, I don't know why he that would be the case. We don't know enough about his family life. There, there was an article in the New York Post that we didn't vet, but that he had a con- very controlling mother. His mother tended to be somewhat cold, although very close to him. Um, I don't know. I don't. I can't go really far with that analysis. But his father passed away when he was 11 years old. I think that plays a huge role here. So I think the absent father during that critical period of his life when he was an adolescent, I think that's probably a huge part of the story. He's remained that, in the house he grew up in too, which I find very interesting. Yeah. He bought, he bought his current home from his mother who then moved to a nursing home. And I forget where somewhere South of, of Long Island, but I want to say I agree with the boring life. You know, we most of us or a lot of us, I don't know if most of us, a lot of us have seen the interview uh, done with Bonjour Realty last year where the realtor interviewed Rex Huerman. And a lot of people mocked or, or didn't understand why the realtor was laughing all the time. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm an interviewer, right? For, for uh, As a reporter, I would interview people. It was very clear to me. He was trying to make the interview fun. He was trying to be lighthearted. He was trying to make Rex Hewerman a little bit more exciting, but he's not exciting. He's boring (laughs) and he has a boring life and he has a boring job. Maybe that's not true, but if you watch the interview, that's at least what I come across thinking. Boring life, boring job, and the interviewer is doing everything he can to make it a little bit more upbeat, (laughs) a little bit more exciting. So I just want to say, this is what I see. I see him as living a boring life too. I validate what you're saying. Yeah, right. But, and I think in it's, I think some of that has to do with depression in the sense that but I, but it goes beyond depression. So I, I think one way to think about that might be to see this, I, to see part of his trauma as unresolved grief related to his father. That I think losing his father at age eleven, and again, you and I, we're just scratching the surface of this. We're gonna we're gonna dig as deep into this as we can as we get more sources and more information. But I, I really think that this seems to me like someone who loses his father at age 11. He's probably has a somewhat ambivalent relationship with his mother, especially if she's overly controlling or maybe even domineering. I don't know. You know, we're going to have to learn more about his family, but I I think you probably, this is the kind of guy that is not going to grieve over his father. And there's probably some trauma there that's unresolved. Again, getting back to this idea of humiliation. It's not the humiliation. It's the unresolved part of the humiliation. I think you probably have some unresolved grief here. Um, For those of you, I'm just going to throw this in. This may not be totally relevant, but for those of you who, who like Shakespeare, um, the, the Michael Fassbender movie in 2017, the interpretation of Shakespeare of Macbeth is one of the most, it's, I think it's a remarkable piece of work, but and one of the reasons it's remarkable is because the movie begins with a an infant on a funeral pyre. And Macbeth and Lady Macbeth are standing around essentially watching their child apparently is has passed away and they're at their child's funeral. And that is not so for those of you who know Macbeth that is not a part of the book. That's an interpretation. But it's a brilliant interpretation because it suggests that the entire sequence of events, including the murders that occur in Macbeth, are related to unresolved grief. And I've, I've never forgotten that scene in that movie because it's such a brilliant interpretation of Macbeth that, that you know, many interpretations of Macbeth focus on whether it's ambition and wanting to be king, blah, blah, blah. I could go on and on. But nobody... Nobody, in, in, at least in a visual format, has had, you know, kind of the courage to suggest that maybe it's grief. We know that Lady Macbeth lost a child or seemingly lost a child. And so this movie takes the risk of putting that child out front and saying, look, you know, this is really about unresolved grief, that Macbeth goes on this murderous rampage because he lost this child. And so I, I think you, you 
potentially you could have something similar here with with Rex Hewerman that you know the loss of his father might have been a major have, um, had a major impact on his adolescence and young adulthood and maybe he never recovered in addition to uh, you know of course there there could be additional traumas the bullying I don't know right we're we're still trying to figure this out but anyway um so that's just a thought I th- I think I think one of the things that often happens with depression is that sometimes anger and repressed hostility become a part of that. In other words, sometimes rage and anger become a way to push away that depression. In fact, Freud, Freud was one of the first people to really hypothesize that depression is really a form of anger. It's really kind of a repressed rage that, and it, it's, it's the rage and the anger that keeps someone from falling into like a full blown clinical depression where they can't function at all. So we know that Huerman was able to function, but I think we, we also know that his victims, my guess is the way that they were found, the way that they were bound, apparently they were strangled to death that uh, that this is somebody who had a lot of rage too. And again, like for those who don't know the story about how he would always cut wood, he would always chop wood with an ax in his front lawn. Some of his neighbors described that as menacing, that when people would say hi to him, he would give them a, you know, a, a really kind of, um, you know, mean spirited look. Um, Right, the, all that would be consistent with somebody who's who's repressing a certain amount of hostility or rage. Okay, yeah. Someone who's, who's trying to kind of fight off this depression, this underlying depression. And Nikki's Nikki's quote about how he's trying to escape from a boring life. You know, in the in the interview that we can't show, but in the interview, he talks about he talks about how one of the qualities that an architect needs or somebody consulting to architects is patience. And I mean, he tells this story about going down to city hall and having to sit there all day and he's in the office for nine hours, you know, seven and a half hours. And then they finally call him in and say, Rex, are you still there? And he says, yep, I'm here. And he uses that as an example of patience. And I thought the only thing I could think of after he told that story was that guy must be filled with rage going into that office after waiting seven and a half hours, because this is someone who does not want to wait. This is someone who wants his way right away, right? This is someone who wants to be dominant. He wants to be recognized. We know now he's obsessed with the immediate attention. Everybody he met or knew or ran into, including Nikki, he said, hey, did you know about the Gilgo Beach murders? I mean, he was like one step shy of saying, that was me. I did it. I did it. He wanted to say that so badly, but he never did. And so can you imagine this guy sitting there for seven and a half hours waiting for a meeting over, you know, something to do with red tape? So No, I can't imagine. Yeah. Don't, don't tick a, a guy like this off. No, I right, can't imagine. Right, exactly. So, I mean, first of all, I'm glad that, the, that whoever that was, the city it's commissioner, safe. I'm glad he's still alive, but... Putting Hopefully. that aside, yeah. putting that aside, I could I could just imagine him going home that night and trying to connect with somebody that he was going to harm. Right, right. Yeah. Like that's that's the vision I have is that 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 yeah he he doesn't he's not he doesn't like his life he's probably disconnected from his family he's there's probably some depression he's got this repressed rage and hostility he doesn't um, connect to people. And he's absolutely taking it out on these women that he's murdering. And he's feeling a sense of dominance. He's feeling a sense of potency. I think there's some some repairs that are being made to his damaged self in a way, I guess, if that's a way of putting it. That's, that's kind of similar to Koberger. I think Koberger is getting some sense of potency from these killings. I think, you know, he's he's... He's been fired as a grad student, essentially. He's been rejected, and he's he's trying to repair that damaged sense of self. I think with with Rex Hewerman, you have a similar dynamic. Um, with him, though, and I'm going to read a quote here. 
you know, there's, there's another interesting component to this. So I, I don't think it's just the trauma. I think there's a component here of not living up to expectations. Okay. In other words, I think there's, he envisioned a certain life for himself um, that involved a lot of success, a lot of attention, a lot of kudos, maybe some awards. I don't know. He has a lot of education. He worked hard. Yeah. He, he worked hard on his education and his schooling and yeah. Well, by, by some accounts, you know, he's, he's made a lot of money and he's been very successful, but it, again, it's, it's in the eye of the beholder. It's right? all relative. Yeah. It's relative to what he thinks he should, his life should be. So this is from a New York times article. It's by Jania Belafonte. July 23rd, 2023. The title of this article is The Class Rage in the Heart of the Gilgo Beach Suspect. Hmm. Here's, what, here's what she says. And this is, I think this is enlightening. But she talks about essentially um, his resentments around not being kind of in the upper echelon of the architectural world. But here, I think, let me, let me read her quote because it's, it's brilliant. So um, here she says, quote, like so many professions, architecture can be punishingly stratified. And Mr. Hewerman, who by all accounts was extremely knowledgeable about the city's labyrinthine building codes, did not fall on the visionary side of the spectrum. But as a journeyman who held bureaucratic authority, he could veto the plans of architects with degrees from Yale and projects in Nantucket who were retained by clients, not accustomed to their ideas getting sidelined. So she, I mean, essentially what she's saying is that he's kind of a mid-level bureaucrat who does some work for the city. He's hardly a visionary. My guess is that in his mind's eye, he, he saw himself as a visionary. He saw himself like a Frank Gehry or, you know, some of the great architects of Frank Lloyd Wright, you know, that are creating visionary structures and buildings. And he's not doing yeah. that. So he's he wants getting, to be Frank Lloyd Wright and he's right. definitely not. <laughs> well, there's, there's, there's kind of this idea of, of failure, of, of failed ideals or failed dreams here. You know, there's a, there's a little bit of a Willie Loman type component of, he had all these pipe dreams and they never came true. And so how does he deal with that? I, I mean, again, she does a brilliant job, I think, of summarizing this, that he held bureaucratic authority. He could veto the plans of architects with degrees from Yale and projects in Nantucket. So in other words, he could stop. He, and he did this, by the way. So the, the guy I mentioned earlier, the contractor, Robert Tefera, and I'm, you know, I don't know him, but apparently he's he's a very well-known contractor that if you get him to do work on your project, it's going to be recognized. But Tefera, um, Tefera called, he's worked with Hewerman. He called Hewerman essentially an obstructionist that all the jobs that, that Tefera or many of the jobs that Tefera did with, with Hewerman, he would hold them up or he would find a small code. He would get into like these bureaucratic red tape, issues, details, minutia, and he would hold projects up and it drove people crazy. Huh. This is what Robert Tefera said. This is from the same article I just quoted. Robert Tefera says, quote, about why, why Hewerman was holding all these projects up. Tefera says, okay. quote, it was a control issue. If sadistic is watching people go through hoops over and over without much reason, it was sadistic. <laughs> wow. Sadistic. Wow. So to Farah, you know, these, these people that don't know this guy's a serial killer are, are, are finding these same qualities, right, of control. And I mean, even, even a bit sadistic in the sense that he's, he's forcing people to go through hoops or, or to recognize these small little bureaucratic, you know, uh, portions of projects just to torture them right he Hewerman knows that he's 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 being a pain in the neck he knows he's holding these things up this is all about control and this is all about domination this is about this is about rex huberman Hewerman 
imposing his will on the world, huh. right? It's, it's about a failed architect in some degree, to some degree that's not a visionary that is taking out that failure on the world. Huh. And of, of course, there's more to the story of course, there's the, there's the, right, there's the bullying, there's the depression. I, you know, there's a lot of components to the story, but the mother, I think, I the think father, these are some, right. these are some of the elements that, that make the most sense to me at the moment. At the moment. Right. And for those that have more inside information into Rex Herman, email us at hidden true crime info at gmail.com. The more we learn, the more detailed we will become. This is the broad picture right now. Right. And, and on that issue of sadism, by the way, uh, and I'll go back to your interview with Nikki. Uh, she mentions it too. She felt like, she felt like Rex Heuerman brought up the Gilgo beach murders with her to kind of taunt her. Right. Right. He, uh, that was a big part of it. I think is this taunting the fact that he's on this date with Nikki and this is what he wants to talk about. He asks if she likes true crime. She says she does. And then he starts talking about the Gilgo beach serial killer. That's crazy. Yeah. I've been wanting to ask you about this. Go ahead. It's almost taunting her in other words. Yeah. And that, that, I think that goes along with this idea of him being a little sadistic, him, you know, wanting to harm people and enjoying it. She said, she said she had the sense that he enjoyed taunting her, right. That he, that he, that her, he words, found that he, her words, it seemed like he was having a mental orgasm talking about this. Her <laughs> words, Nikki words. And she explained, she goes, you know, when you're talking with a friend about true crime, that was not what this was. He was getting something out of this. Yes. Sadistic then. Right, exactly. And so I think that's, when you start putting these pieces together, when you start looking at this need for dominance and control, maybe some element of thrill seeking. And again, I'll bring up Nikki here. Nikki, Nikki believed he was committing these crimes because it was a bit of a thrill that if his life at home was boring, then this was a chance for him to really, to really find something that wasn't boring, right? It was, it was a chance to find something that was thrilling. Um, and I'm going to read on that issue. I want to read from so one of the one of the few. There's not a lot of great academic articles on serial killers, but this is this is one of the better ones. This is by Lawrence Miller okay. from a journal called Aggression and Violent Behavior. He has two parts to this article. This is part two. It's called Serial Killers: Part Two, Development, Dynamics, and Forensics. This is published in. 2014. He is summarizing the work of Robert Simon. Robert Simon is a psychiatrist, a forensic psychiatrist, who's done a lot of work with murderers and violent offenders. And so Simon kind of echoes some of my sentiments tonight. So I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to talk about Miller's interpretation of Simon here because I think it summarizes a lot of what I've been talking about but and it's interesting too because Simon Simon does not see serial killers necessarily as well it, the quote will will show this but as necessarily as antisocial predators he sees them as damaged individuals so here's the here's what Miller says about Simon Simon's approach <clears throat> Simon's approach places the underlying psychology of the serial killer not primarily in antisocial predation and narcissistic entitlement, but fundamentally in a core of self-loathing from which the killer briefly relieves himself in the acts of controlling, torturing, and killing a victim. In this view, only the most intensely violent sexually sadistic exploitation of his, vic of his victims can bring the serial killer out of an emotional deadness to life, temporarily enabling him to feel calm and relaxed. 
Many serial killers report a profound sense of relief after carrying out a torture and murder episode, stating that this act is the only way they can feel, quote, normal, unquote. The only way they can feel normal. So that would be consistent with this idea of kind of thrill seeking that if you have someone who's intensely depressed or somewhat depressed and they have this, let's say this underlying resentment or rage, they have this need for domination. They feel like a failure to some degree because they haven't lived up to their expectations. Right. So there's kind of this unlived life idea that they act out. They act out through this violent, aggressive, sexually sadistic manner because it makes them feel in control. And as Simon says, it helps them deal with this quote, emotional deadness to life. I I think that's, that was, I love that interpretation. I don't know if it's right on, but it's, 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 it's an interesting way of, it's a version of kind of what I'm saying tonight, I think. I also want to point out that Robin wrote uh, a great comment. Imagine the thrill he would have gotten telling his victims that he was Lisk. We're talking about sadistic, you know, almost like that was his next step. If Nikki Brass had gotten in his car and made a different choice that night or didn't call her friend or didn't have backup. Right. Was that, would that be part of like the sadism, like the sadistic quality of, by the way, I am Lisk. Yeah, no, I, I could definitely see him doing that. Because it, at that moment, you know, assuming that, assuming he, I, whatever, I don't know if we have all the details about how he committed these crimes, by the way. There's some belief now that he committed the crimes at his house and then right. took the bodies over to Guildwell Beach and dumped them, um, which makes sense because he's he's trying to confuse the crime scene and he obviously he doesn't want he doesn't want any particular evidence to be in a closed space at a crime scene because that's that's the easiest way to decipher a uh, suspect is when right. there's a lot of evidence in a closed space and so he obviously knew enough to know to take the bodies elsewhere where they would decompose and it would be very hard to figure out or, or to gather any forensic evidence in in that type of a crime scene. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So So I I think that's I think maybe did I I think that's kind of my introduction to this case. I don't know. Okay. I'm, I'm presenting a, a lost serial killer. Any other any people you would compare this to? So Israel Keys, who who else fits the description? Yeah. Um, I think you'd have to ask. So right. So wh- what serial killers have committed sex crimes? or lust killings that were the main motif is dominance. Israel keys certainly would fit that category. Mm-hmm. Israel keys, I think. And again, if we're talking about paraphilias, uh, Israel keys was also had a paraphilia that was necrophilia. Israel keys would molest corpses. As far as we know, Rex Hunerman's not doing that. So, but in terms of Israel Keys, his main theme was dominance, that he he definitely was interested in torturing and prodding and harming and hurting his victims as much as possible. And he found that to be really erotic. So I think that Rex Hunerman has a similar characteristic. A lot of people are bringing up the BTK said uh, Rex is his twin or he's just like him. You know, there's, I mean, so BTK would also be a lust murderer. Um, But in terms of victims, I, you know, he was, he was choosing victims that were within his geographical region, kind of like Hewerman, but he wasn't 
targeting women that were as vulnerable as Lisk. I think, well, let me take that back that BTK's victims, they were all vulnerable. Of course, some of them were a little elderly, but you know, it, if you read about BTK and his, and the crime scenes and his, his murders, you're not going to find such a homogenous group as Rex Heuerman in terms of age, body type, right? Rex Heuerman's clearly focused on his desirability is much clearer than somebody like BTK or even Israel Keys for that matter. Okay. And a lot of people bringing up Ed Kemper. Any thoughts? Yeah. Ed, yeah, Ed Kemper is, is, you know, Ed Kemper mutilated his mother. And I mean, like, they're, and again, I don't, we don't know enough about Rex Human's mother, but it does, there does seem to be kind of an ambivalent, problematic relationship with his mother. And that was the source of a lot of Ed Kemp, Ed, Edmund Kemper's pathology. So I think that could be a similarity. We don't know enough yet, but, but that's true. Uh, Kemper focused on a very specific class of victims. Most of them were in a similar age range. Um, they were, most of them were college students, female college students that were somewhat uh, vulnerable. I mean, he he mm-hmm. overwhelmed them with force. So, but but yeah, that's true in terms of, if you look at the victims and the kind of the, what we started with in this discussion, I think that, um, I think someone like BTK may feel some closeness or affinity to Hewerman because they're both sexual sadists and they're both lust killers, lust murderers. But I don't, you know, if you look deeper, I think Hewerman, I, I think there's quite a few differences. Yeah. Thank you. Um, there was a question. What do you think about him? Um, there are a few stories of him sort of, talking with uh, women that didn't necessarily become his victims, but sort of uh, jumping out at women, startling them, being kind of, um, I guess that's part of the dominance, right? Just sort of over kind of just this intimidating persona. Uh, That was a great question. Somebody asked. Yeah, well, let's, he would so sort let's of jump out that. from the bushes. Yeah, some people would refer to him. Whether or not this is exactly how it happened, I don't know. But people would say it was almost like he came out of the bushes, jumped out of the bushes, and started talking to women. You know, in kind of unkempt clothes. <laughs> yeah. The, so, <clears throat> a couple thoughts on that. You know, one something as simple as the the interview he gave to the realtor the realtor said that he had one of the most, how did he put it? He had one of the most aggressive. Handshake. He, he said that his heart handshake was so firm. It was like grasping the thing of marble. Yeah. And so, I mean, something as simple as a handshake. And, and by the way, that's something I look at when I evaluate criminals is I always start with, with a handshake and I want to see whether they're, are they trying to take my hand off? Are they shaking my hand for a minute? Are they shaking my hand for two seconds? Are they giving me a limp handshake? I know that doesn't sound like much, but when I'm starting an interview with a criminal, I want as much information as I can. Are they making eye contact? Are they greeting me in a personable way? Are they saying, how are you, right? Are they showing empathy? And I'm, I'm learning all that in the first two minutes in a, in a jail cell or a prison with an inmate. So, uh, so handshakes matter. And Somebody who a, a realtor that he's giving like a really dominant handshake to, I think that's interesting. That's potentially diagnostic of it fits this theme of dominance. Same thing with him jumping out of the woods and surprising people. There's a story with one of his associates, right? Uh, he called him in to watch a video. Yes. That uh, was a woman. Boy. Or no, it was a it was a man. It was, it was a, man. a male, yeah. It was a male, yeah. and he called him in to watch a, a gore video that was 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 bad, was quite horrendous. And the coworker had no idea what he was showing him. And so this this moment occurs in the video that's quite gory, mm-hmm. and the coworker's taken aback and doesn't quite know how to react to it. And so again, that's that theme of dominance that Hewerman's in control. He's got the upper hand. He's trying to upset his coworker. It's, it's, 
this theme of domination is such a big theme for him. I think you, you, you just see it everywhere that you look with this guy. Yeah, right. And, you know, you can see the handshake during the interview. He walks in and shakes his hand. We can't show this interview, guys. We had the interview up, and I had some 20-second uh, sound bite shorts showing different parts of the interview. They've all been taking them down. We got a... Uh, we got a mark for copyright. So even though all these other news agencies have the interview and these sound bites up, we cannot show them here on hidden true crime. So, uh, but, but you know, you can go and see a, quite a few of these different, uh, different clips of the interview on, on the news, but there's a moment where you can see the handshake and it is, he doesn't let go. He doesn't let go. So, um, Somebody asked, and I'm curious too, knowing what you know about Koberger, if indeed Koberger um, is guilty, what type mm. of killer would that make him? Or I guess, or would he not be a serial? Yeah, I, I think Koberger. So when those, when that crime occurred and we had no idea who the suspect was, I speculated that this was more like a mass murder. And then right. he, tend, he tended to fit the profile more of a, a mass murderer who might like use a gun, like a school shooter. And I, I still think that's true with Koberger. I don't, so serial killers are much different in the sense that they, they, will, they will murder their victims one at a time over a period of time. They won't, unlike a mass murderer who will murder two or more, three or more people at the same time at the same place. And so... This is different in the sense that like, you can't really, I mean, it's possible that Kohlberger could have committed other crimes, so we don't know that. But, but given what we know, I think that the, there's a different dynamic between a mass murder. Well, let me take it back. There's, there are underlying similar psychological elements between mass murderers and serial killers. But, for example, shame would be one of those. Humiliation would be another one. Kind of what I said earlier about how dominance and humiliation seem to be the two underlying motivations for lust murderers. I think for Koberger, you know, I think shame plays a big role as well. So there are some underlying dynamics, but the way the murders are carried out are quite different. And so I don't know if that analogy quite works, but, but yeah, there are similar dynamics among all murderers. Yeah. Um, someone brought up, and this is a question I have too, the taunting of his victim's family members calling a 15 year old sister yeah. to taunt her after he killed her sister. Mm -hmm. Well, is that part of the sadism? Yeah, that's the lust? Yeah, for sure. That's, that's very much that sadistic component. And again, it's very much related. So sadism would be, I see, I would see sadism, sadism would be a branch of dominance. So okay. sadism would be like if you had a tree, right, and dominance was your trunk, sadism would be one of the branches that would be an expression of dominance. So the goal is dominance. Sadism would be a part of that. Wow. That he's he is finding it pleasurable and enjoyable to create pain, to have the sister suffer, a 15-year-old sister suffer from – from those types of calls. Okay. Wow. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else you want to say about this interview? Um, the Bonjour Realty interview. You brought up some really interesting things that he said to me, and we've discussed the interview. Yeah. Um, you thought it was yeah. interesting. Yeah. You know, so... The most interesting element of the interview, and I'm sorry we can't play it, but we had it up for a while, but we, we just can't, we can't risk getting another strike. But <clears throat> maybe, maybe in a future episode on Hewerman, we can, we can read it or use it or read it verbatim. But yeah, but well, and I, I want to say this too, for those that listen to our podcast, we will be able to just play it on our podcast. And so okay. we edit these to make them more refined for our podcast for our listeners. So um, in about a week or so or a few days, this will be on our podcast and we'll have it there for anyone interested, these particular parts. But go ahead, babe. Yeah, so, and, and we might, 
we might end with this as well. I think this might be a good way to go out because I think this is this is the most fascinating part of that interview. You know, it's amazing how much you can pick up on in a 20 minute interview. There's so much in there that speaks to his psychological state, you know, the, 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 his perceptions of the world. Um, but I think the most interesting element of the entire interview was when he talked about how, when he became an architect, I think, well, well, the, I think the realtor asked him the question, what have you learned? And Huerman says, essentially, I had to learn about people. And, and what he says is, and, and I, is, I think some of you have probably seen this, but what he says is, you know, when, when I became an architect, I thought that there, were, it was, there was a technical aspect and I would go build buildings and this was just about creating a structure. This was about creating a building. And then I realized, oh, wait a minute. You know, I, I may have to learn something about people. So he divides up, he divides up architecture into what he calls the technical elements of architecture and the people part of architecture. <laughs> and so... Uh, as I if, know the exact part you're talking about. I watched this. I was like, oh my gosh, John. Right. Yeah. It's a, you know what's amazing about it is I almost have the sense that, that Huerman went into architecture thinking, I think he goes into architecture thinking he's going to become the next Frank Lloyd Wright or whatever. I think he seems some type of fame and fortune in architecture. I think his goal, I, you know, there also another part of the story. I think there's this underlying perfectionism that's it's probably, and perfectionism is almost always rooted in shame, by the way, that oftentimes people that have a lot of shame will seek perfectionism to try to cover up that shame or think of it as perfectionism is a way to cover up imperfections. And as someone who's a recovering perfectionist, <laughs> I, can speak, I can speak a lot to this issue. But anyway, um, I, I have the sense that, that Hewerman gets into architecture with the sense of perfection and the sense of limitless, po limitless possibilities. That, he's, he, that the way I see it is that he sees himself as building the perfect home or the perfect structure, right? He has this fantasy of fame and fortune and he's going to, he's going to create, you know, the, like think Frank Gehry, he's going to create like the structure that the world's going to talk about and love and visit. And maybe he's going to do it in New York. I don't know. Maybe he's going to do another MoMA. Who knows? I know they just redid that, but so he probably won't do that, but I'm talking about his fantasies. So he wants to create the perfect structure. Okay. That's his dream. However, there's one big problem, and that is over time, Rex Hunerman starts realizing that people inhabit those structures. And what Hick Rex Hunerman starts realizing is that people are imperfect. <laughs> and so here you have this perfectionist with depression and a sense of dom, all this stuff, right? He wants to be... He wants to create this perfect structure. And then all of a sudden he recognizes, oh my gosh, like people are in structures and people are imperfect. And maybe this fan, maybe this isn't what I pictured, right? So he gets, he gets mired in all this consulting stuff where he's dealing with codes and details. And this is not the life he envisioned. This was not what he expected. And he certainly didn't expect having to deal with people. And so some of my closing thoughts here would be, I don't, I'm going to make kind of an obscure reference here. I don't know if people have seen this movie, but um, the, you know, the, the director, Lars von Trier, who's somewhat controversial and some have called him a visionary. He's certainly a, a really interesting director. He came out with a movie in 2018 called The House That Jack Built. The House That Jack Built is about a serial killer who happens to be an engineer with architectural dreams. <laughs> so the house that Jack built, Jack's goal in the end is to build the perfect home. He wants to create the, the perfect home, right? It, it, he, he's got all these plans. He starts building it. The problem is it never meets his expectations. 
So Jack starts tearing down that home. Like he can't, every time he gets one structure put up, it doesn't meet expectations and he tears it down because he's a, he's a bit of a perfectionist. And so anyway, he keeps trying these homes get, keep getting torn down and you start real. And there's a lot more to this movie, by the way, it's, it's, it's not an easy movie to watch by the way. It's, it's a very gory movie. It's, it's a tough, tough movie to watch, but over time, and I don't want spoiler alert here. I don't want to give this away, but over time you start realizing that what Von Trier is really after is creating Von Trier is trying to, to, to get us to understand that building a home isn't about a structure, that building a home is about something more. It's about people. It's about love. It's about connection. It's about populating that structure with people that matter and that you can connect to. So it makes sense that a serial killer can't build a home because a serial killer can't put people in there to love, right? So... So what happens towards the end of the movie, and again, spoiler alert for those who haven't seen it, he finally constructs a home. But that home isn't a home. That's a home that's composed of dead bodies. It's composed of all the people he's murdered. Sounds okay, familiar. So he, he, he finally, he builds a home. It just happens to be a home of dead bodies, of the dead bodies he's killed, right? And so... Von Trier is is continuing with this metaphor of what a home is and what it means. It's not a you know, but but I think what Von Trier is doing with that, it, and it's a really grotesque scene, by the way. But I mean, it's it's memorable. <laughs> but um, but I think what what Von Trier is trying to say with that scene is that the 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 bo- the home of dead bodies that he builds is a reflection of his inner deadness it's a reflection of his inability to connect with other people it's a reflection of his own depression it, in fact it so it that part of this that part of the movie actually reminded me a lot of rex huerman yeah that huerman can't really build a home because he doesn't have the human qualities to do it in the same way that Jack in the movie can't build a home that doesn't that's that's a real home that doesn't consist of dead bodies because he doesn't have the vitality and the empathy and the love and the ability to really build a home that we would consider a home. And people are even pointing out that his house was in a lot of disarray and needing repair. Yeah. His actual home. The home he grew up in. Right, exactly. And so, I, you know, when I think about Rex Huerman, at least now, and of course we're going to learn more, and I think about like this movie, and the, the, the villain, by the way, in that movie is not really like Huerman in the sense that he's not a lust murderer. He's a serial killer, but he's not a lust murderer. But um, I think that, you know, the, the message I got from that movie, and it's the message I get when I think about Huerman, is, you know, there, there's probably no such thing as the perfect home. Because people are imperfect. Right. And if you really want to love people and connect to people and understand people, you have to recognize that people are imperfect and you have to have compassion for them and understanding. And it doesn't matter what walk of life they're in. It doesn't matter where they work, right? Like, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I went out to eat with my dad and it was really hot out and there was a homeless person outside and you know, we brought her some lunch and brought it out to her and talked to her. And it's just, the, the home is a metaphor for something else. I mean, sure, we can we can have a nice home. It's a building. But but I, I think that's true of Huerman. It's true of that movie. Maybe it's true of life in general. But I, I think the kind of the moral here, for me at least, is that when Rex Huerman talks about how the importance of people and understand people he certainly has a different understanding than I do because he's not willing to allow that people are imperfect. And I think that that's the tragedy here is that that Rex Huerman, for whatever reasons, just 
fails to connect to human beings and sees, sees human beings as objects or objectifies them and certainly isn't willing to make allowances for people's imperfections. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. John. That was an amazing moment in the interview for me too, where he says, I've learned how to understand people and then goes into the technical side of architecture. In other words, he hasn't, he doesn't understand people. Everything's technical. Yeah. Well, he, he thought it would be technical. He thought you could, you could have the perfect plans, building plans, and you could construct the perfect building and fame and fortune would follow. But again, like there's people behind those plans. <laughs> there's, there's people that are going to live in that home. Right. So I don't know. It, there's a total disconnect there, but I, I, this whole, I think if you really want to understand Rex Huerman, understanding that statement from his video and understanding what it means to be an architect for him is so critical. That being an architect really defines his worldview, but it's a worldview that's completely skewed because it doesn't include people. And as Mayor Bear says, the house that Rex grew up in will probably be demolished and torn down. Right. And that's, and thank you for that. That's, that's another part of this story, which is that you can build all the houses you want, but eventually they're all going to fall apart. Eventually they're all going to come down over time. It, you know, so it's not the house. It's what happens in the house with the people in the house. Yeah. Design or build. Some people, yeah. Design or build. Right design any house you want. Thank you. Thanks, babe. This is our, this is our broad picture of Rex Huerman. It is not our last. So again, I request anyone with any inside information, anyone that also wants their story told to email us at hidden true crime info at gmail.com. We are hoping for some insider info as we continue to assess this case and who Rex Huerman is. And we hope to uh, delve into more interviews just like uh, Nikki Brass and to give um, more people a voice when it comes to Lisk, when it comes to the Long Island um, SK or Gilgo Beach SK. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for joining with us on a Sunday night. Thanks for liking <laughs> yeah. this video. Uh, it doesn't mean you like the topic necessarily, but thank you for liking the video. If you did appreciate this live tonight and uh, please share with your friends and uh, please subscribe as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for all thanks, the new guys. Members. Thanks for joining us tonight. I know Sunday's not our normal night. So thanks for, thanks for tuning in and listening. We appreciate it. Debbie. Thank you so much. Debbie, uh, you're always so generous. We appreciate you. Thank you. We'll see you guys. Bye-bye. All right. Good night. Good night. And one last thing, as I missed the end broadcast button, thank you to our amazing moderators. Thank you. See ya. Yeah. Thanks, guys.